speaking about how you've come to a, a sense of home and settledness as a monk. Um, I remember meeting you for the first time years ago as a young, when I was a young monk and the, you know, a really distinctive sense of, uh, of metta and faith and an openness about that faith that I found rare. Um, we're very restrained about it, you know, even translating sata as, you know, confidence, where, which there's a place for, I understand, but um, it strikes me, your, that sort of home or place that you found is distinctive in two ways, um, at least as far as, as I've felt. Um, one is the, the fact that it is um, very much a quality of love uh, for you in, in a very unabashed way, um, as evidenced by, you know, these trips to India and um, your shrine. And I, I remember a story of you at Wat Pananachat, maybe you can elaborate, having to go on Tudong and being told that you'd have to leave several statues behind and, and being unwilling to and just bringing them along, which I thought was great. Um, but the other was the fact that you have a great faith in the bodhisattva path and bodhisattvas, um, if, if I'm correct. And I just wanted to ask about two aspects of those. One is how you do, you know, I know several practitioners here who are struggling to kind of find a balance between these two sides of, of Buddhism, um, you know, to put it that way, Mahayana and Theravada, Bodhisattva and Arahant paths, and how you've found a place to rest between those two. Um, and second, you know, in terms of embodying faith and giving uh, expression to that, how would you suggest people make shrines? How, how would you, uh, any specific advice for making and building a place of devotion? Yeah. <laughs> so I wasn't told that I wasn't allowed to take the statues. I just decided I was going to take them. <laughs> and uh, so I had this little little box and I had a small statue of Maitreya and a small statue of White Tara. Actually, this is something I picked up, believe it or not, in California. Hmm. What, what has, seems to have been a part of my karma that I went to live, Ajahn Pasano had been one of my teachers, I'd been his attendant as a novice in his last year in Thailand. And uh, so I decided to spend my fourth and fifth rainy season retreats at Abayagiri. And I guess the day I arrived, I was told that His Holiness the Dalai Lama was coming to teach in LA and that I'd already been registered to attend. <laughs> so in terms of like past karma is ripening, it's like when nobody even asked me, did you want to go? I was told, you're going. And, uh, which, you know, it's fine. On the stage, you, you know, I was, we were in the accommodations. It was the University of Southern California and the, the students were on their summer vacation and uh, those accommodations had been made available to the monastics. And I was sharing a two-bedroom dorm with uh, Sudanto, Ajahn Sudanto. I was three punters, I guess he was five, something like that. And it kind of, it occurred to me, oh my God, I'm about to see the Dalai Lama this lifetime. And I felt like I haven't done any preparation. I, I, I don't feel worthy. And I, I went to my room and I started doing full-length prostrations in the direction of where the Dalai Lama was going to be. I'd never done a full-length prostration in my life. And I was like, I was just suddenly doing full-length prostrations <laughs> in the University of Southern California dormitory. And um, sitting on the stage, I guess it was like seven meters from His Holiness for about five days, Lumpur Pasana, Ajahn Amro, Lumpur Punadamo were there. Sedanto, myself, John Kurundamu. The te and with regards to the teaching, I mean, it was it's a Galugpa style. It was going through, they go through all of these different views from different Buddhist schools and then finally tell you at the end why, why then, which one's the actual one that you should have faith in. And, you know, I'm being a bit impatient. I'm kind of like, why don't you just tell us the one that's the real one? And 
skipped the previous four days. And <laughs> <laughs> That's a terribly rude thing to say, and I ask forgiveness. But I guess the, the, the Galupa approach is knowing wrong views, you understanding why it's a wrong view, and then understanding why something is a right view. You don't just get it intuitively and have faith in it. You, you also rationally, logically, deeply understand why the correct view of emptiness is the correct view of emptiness. But there was this huge painting of white Tara above the stage. And I was just captivated. And Tupton Chodron Bhikkhuni was sitting next to us, not far away. And I said to her, and His Holiness was giving a white Tara empowerment at the end of the teaching. And I'm like, excuse me, Venerable, do you have to actually take the Bodhisattva vow to get the empowerment? And she's like, yeah, I think you do. <laughs> and I'm like, hmm. I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure I can commit to this. <laughs> and so, but I wanted, I wanted Tara's blessings. I mean, I just, I was just, there was definitely some kind of recognition uh, with regards to white Tara. And so there was this, there's this Bodhisattva vow. And if you actually read it, you don't, you, it, it doesn't say I'll be a Buddha. It says, I vow to be enlightenment. I vow to attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. Now that can be interpreted in several ways. The first two verses. The third verse was, as long as beings remain, as long as space remains, until then may I too remain, dispel the miseries of the world. So I kind of folded that bit under. I'm like, no. <laughs> no, I'm not doing this as long as space remains business. But I am, I am happy to do this. I'll attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. Why not? And then I remember saying to White Tara, okay, well, you, you just bless me to the degree that's possible with my uh, wishy-washy <laughs> commitment here. And, uh, but I did start doing the mantra. And uh, I just resonated with it. And I felt like something that had been missing in my life. I did feel like I found it. So even living with Ajahn Anand, who is a very meta monk, and they do certainly talk about devas and some bodhisattvas there, I didn't have this as a practice. I suppose I would call this practice devanusati if, if we're trying to understand it in terms of a Pali tradition context. Mm -hmm. And uh, Visuddhi Magha says that the devanusati is appropriate for people with a strong faith proclivity. So if you don't believe they exist, there's not much point, right? But for myself, for whatever reason, I would assume past life imprints and practices. I just felt like Tara existed and wanted to do her mantra. And interestingly enough, when I went back to Bogaya to make my commitment to do another 10 years after the first 10 years, I did my one millionth Tara mantra in front of the Tara statue in the Mahabodhi temple. Hmm. And I thought that I would suddenly get into the 21 Taras and, you know, once I'd done a million Tara, that this was going to go. And it was almost like you did that. And uh, I didn't get more deeply into Tara practices. And I had attended His Holiness's teaching in Australia and His Holiness gave the 1,000 Am Chen Rizik empowerment and I was sitting three meters from him when he was visualizing the mandala. And so perhaps not so surprisingly, I started resonating with the mantra Om Mani Padme Hum, which I hadn't done before. And so I have done, I guess, three million Om Mani Padme Hums now. And I, must, I probably have this Tibetan practice of counting how many mantras you do. <laughs> so we don't count how many Buddhas we do, right? It's a 10 million Buddhas by now or whatever. But um, anyway, so His Holiness passed through California a second time. I was in America for a year and a half and the Dalai Lama passed through twice. The second time he passed through in the San Francisco area and he gave the Medicine Buddha Empowerment and he gave a teaching on the, the Heart Sutra and I resonated with that. Like one of my favorite meditations is the, the sky like empty space and I and it's a different list in the Pali tradition. They talk about the four elements but there's another list of the six elements earth, wind, fire and water space and consciousness 
and I don't know, there's something about adding space and consciousness makes it much more interesting. <laughs> and so I, I like meditating on space, and Lumpur Samedo does recommend that I think, just a, as another way of making the mind less contracted and less focused on self and others and concepts of just noticing space. And so I resonated with the short version of the Heart Sutra, and I by now loved the Dalai Lama. So when I went back, and I was, then I started to really miss Thailand. Like, yeah, I was grateful for the 18 months in California. And, uh, but now I had another tool. I felt I could go back now because the forest tradition, I had experienced it as being kind of dry, death meditation, elements meditation. And uh, I guess the Thais culturally have more metta than, than we arrive at the training with, and they have more faith. But now I had this uh, Devanusati practice. But in my experience of it is that if you have strong faith and if you do mantras diligently, it's kind of like a practice that meets you halfway. That's my experience. Like if I sincerely do a mantra, I actually do feel some kind of blessing come after mm. a period of time. It's not just doing the mantra. It's like mm. one set, set, set. It's like a tuning fork in a way. And when you resonate you resonate on that vibration, then that blessing comes. Hmm. And so now I now I now had a way, and you know, the, the patriarchy and the separation from women. I mean, I grew up with sisters and my best friends had been women and I'd been close to women. And now I was living in this all male community and uh, it was pretty macho and very critical. And now I could just secretly visualize a goddess, white Tara, with her beautiful, I better not say that, above my head. And, uh, you know, she could drip nectar of the bliss of emptiness. And so it was like, you know, I, I now had something else. And uh, very helpful. And so, you know, I, I by that stage knew that this, this was helpful for me. I'd seen it in my own mind. I, I was happier as a bhikkhu with this samatha practice and this extra source of blessings. And so Tanajananan actually checked her out and said, yeah, she's real, and she's got full barami, and she's really beautiful. Hmm. And that really changed things for me, because here's my, here's my arahant telling me that my bodhisattva is real. And so, yeah, I was going into the jungle, and Tara was coming with me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had a statue of Maitreya, and I had a statue of White Tara. They weren't big, but they were made of copper, and they were kind of heavy you know, four days of walking in the heat in Kanchanaburi in, in the, the hot season. So, you know, what do I do? I'm thinking, I don't need my work sabong. I don't need my bathing cloth. I can request new ones when we get to the <laughs> monastery. I was like, anybody want this uh, new? Anybody want this? And I was like giving things away, but I did not give away my supply of Indian incense or my bodhisattva statues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I guess it's just like, yeah, these some of these habits, you carry them from from past practices, I would assume. Mm. And I mean, like right now I'm holding a mala. Huh? It's just mm. you know, one. Uh, I find that my Dharma talks are more lucid if I have bees running through my fingers. It's just, it's weird. Mm. And uh, yeah, so how did I, how did I marry it? It's interesting, isn't it? Because it seems, it seems like, it seems like I went out of my way, but it was Ajahn Pasano that told me I was going to the Dalai Lama's teachings, you know? It was my Theravadan teachers that got me on that stage where that empowerment was happening. So, yeah, my karma, my karma mixed it all up. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and Ajahn Amro, who was the co-abbot of a biker at the time, was pretty eclectic. I mean, he had a he had a tanker of white tar in the office mm. uh, where he that he and Ajahn, you know, and there was that connection with the city of ten thousand Buddhas. When Ajahn Pasano had an option of what he wanted to do, uh, I think, I can't remember what birthday it was, perhaps the 60th, and he said, I want to go to the Buddhist Himalayas of India. Hmm. So I would assume Ajahn Pasano has some, some uh, seeds in there as well. Hmm. So, yeah, and I think at least those of us who've been monks for several lifetimes, I think it's the case that sometimes it's Theravada and sometimes it's Mahayana and sometimes it's Vajrayana. Some people may make very, very strong resolves. May I only be born in the Theravada and practice the true uh, mm -hmm. teachings of the elders and in the 
in the correct Pali. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and uh, I, I, by now, I've been doing this for 25, 26 years. And I've done, I haven't just done the 3,000 hours of meditation in Bokai. I've probably done about 30,000 hours of meditation now. And uh, so one develops some intuitions. And I think, I think a vow I may have made in the past was not to be attached to a country or a school of Buddhism, but to actually be born in a situation where I would meet the enlightened beings of the age practicing with high standards. Mm. And so that may have manifested as a life in Nalanda, a life in Taxila, a life in Shaolin, mm. and then Wat mm. And it makes you a bit weird. Like you, have, you, you have a bunch of eclectic practices. and uh, But to me... I don't experience confusion about them because for me it's all Buddhism. Mm. And, uh, and I guess one of the reasons I love practicing in Bogaya is that sense of the whole family's there. Mm. And, uh, you know, that sense of there's some Chinese chanting. I probably did some of that in a past life. There's the lovely Sri Lankan chanting. I might have done that in a past life. There's the Thai I'm doing that this life. And there's that just sense of the richness of these practices. And uh, if you see it as Samatha and Vipassana, Hmm. if you see it as, as that. And if my understanding of the difference between the Arahant path and the Bodhisattva path is they're extremely similar. The only issue is you're willing to do it much longer. So it's one still cultivates mindfulness and clear comprehension. One is still practicing for samadhi and insight. But it's going to ripen differently. But the and with the Bodhisattva practitioner, there's going to have to be more of an emphasis on the four Brahma Viharas hmm. to make it sustainable. But I just look at it, and I just look at it myself in terms of what is a samatha practice, what is a contemplative practice, what is a wisdom contemplation, and uh, and yeah, I guess I'm on the one monk once asked me when we were in Daudam if I was the because they used to have nicknames for the, in that's the jungle area of retreat. They used to have nicknames for the various ways up the mountain. There was kind of the, I think mm. there was Sotapanna, and then there was Sotapanna, which was steep and fast, and there and and then there was the Bodhisattva, which was long and winding and longer. And uh, somebody asked me which which path I was on, and I I said I'm on the scenic route. <laughs>